No mai, hara mai, tēnā koutou katoa. We'll start as usual with a karakia. Whakataka te hau ki te uru. Whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta. Kia mā tāra tāra ki tāi. E hi a ke ana te atakura. He tio, he huka, he hauhu. Tihei, mauri ora. So warm welcome to all of you and acknowledgement of the Indigenous lands where we are broadcasting from and mana whenua um, of the lands that we stand on. A warm welcome to all of you and the Indigenous lands where you're joining us from today. This is another Toi Caucus, um, Tones Toi Caucus webinar. And um, as usual, we'll do a few uh, little housekeeping in this new virtual space that we create uh, regularly as an opportunity for us all to learn together. Um, and I'll do the housekeeping and then introduce our wonderful guest um, briefly and then hand it over to you if that's okay. Today, there are two of us here from Toi Caucus. Um, my name is Miriam, I'm the Toi Caucus manager. And um, I have my colleague, Jala Lawrence who's one of the TOE coordinators, and we'll be tag-teaming in supporting our presenter today, who is Dr. Manjeet Burke. A reminder in terms of our sessions, often we talk about sexual violence or um, different kinds of violence, and so it's a reminder for all of those who don't usually talk in that space um, that this is the case. Uh, sorry, I'm going to tag-team my... Um, presentation slightly so that those with um, hearing impairments might be able to get connected with the transcriber. So I'm going to put in the, the chat um, the transcription information. So this is our first webinar um, where we are actually transcribing, which we're really excited to have. Um, so for those who do need to access the service, all the information is in the chat now. I'm also going to put in the chat the information for our self-talk helpline. So if any of the people have lived experience of sexual violence and need support afterwards, that is a great place to go. This topic, we are going to be talking about um, racism, as the title does um, does clearly state. And we really want to acknowledge the mixture of experiences in the group. So we'll have those with lived experience and knows this topic from that perspective, as well as those who might be um, learning something very new as they hold um, whole privilege from having white skin. And so being really mindful of how we hold this space together and especially inviting those with lived experience to share their experience and engage in this conversation and inviting everyone to be mindful of how we're interacting with each other. Um, that is pretty much all from us. Have I forgotten anything that I said I would say? <laughs> Um, I want to warmly welcome um, Dr. Manjeet Burke. I've had the opportunity to have different conversations over the last few months, and I feel very excited and privileged that we have managed to um, create this webinar and this opportunity for the sexual violence sector to hear from you. And um, I, every time we have conversations, I learn so much, and I'm really excited to hear more about your research, which I think is so valuable for any feminist organising um, organisations or organising groups on how we how we consider these intersections in a really um, deliberate and purposeful way to ensure um, that you know our organizing spaces can um, also address racism. So um, I will take up no further time and warmly welcome you and hand over to you. Thank you so much, Miriam, for uh, for the invitation, the lovely welcome, um, and to both you and Jala for all the work in organizing today. I sincerely appreciate it, and it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm just going to get started and um, share my screen, and that way we can take a look at the presentation together. Um, also, as I've mentioned before, I have a terrible tendency of speaking very quickly, so I'm going to quite deliberately try to slow myself down as much as possible, um, but I, I really encourage you to please um, give me a wave if, um, if the talking is happening too quickly um, or if I'm taking um, too much uh, liberties with, um, with my words so you're not able to catch up. So I'm just going to get started um, and get right into it, get right into this really important work at the intersections of race and gender. Um, we're going to be talking about my research, my PhD research that I completed in 2019 at the University of British Columbia um, in Vancouver, Canada. I am here in, um, in Tamakita Makoto uh, in 
Aterova for the last um, approximately a year. Um, I've been here and it's been my great pleasure to be a postdoctoral research fellow working alongside um, Dr. Heather Kim Fryer and Dr. Jackie Kidd. Um, it's been such a wonderful opportunity and I'm so excited to, to be able to share a little bit more of my work. So as I mentioned, it's really contextual based in Vancouver, but um, with my experiences in feminist organizations, I do believe that this research translates to to a variety of different environments. Um, so, so I'm looking forward to chatting more about them. So just to, to get right into it, I'd like to start off by acknowledging the traditional and unceded, unsurrendered territories of the Algonquin Anishinaabek people, which is where I have the privilege of living and working every day um, up in Canada. I also want to acknowledge the traditional unceded and unsurrendered territories of um, the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Stolo nations, which is where this research took place. Um, it's really important from a Canadian context for us to situate um, who we are and where we come from because of the fact that um, much of Canada is on um, occupied and unsurrendered territories. Um, so the action of colonization continues um, and it's important when we're having any conversation about anti-racism to really remember that and to be mindful of that. I also just want to take a moment to acknowledge myself as um, a visitor here on Maori territories in Aitaroa. It's been a real pleasure um, for me to be doing so much important learning um, on this land and it's been such a privilege to be here. So the story that I want to talk about today, the, the conversation I want to have is about cracks, systemic cracks primarily. Um, my work has been working with feminist organizations nationally, locally, and um, internationally dealing with um, different forms of feminism. So I've worked primarily in um, social justice spaces around anti-violence work, but I've also done a lot of work in ethno-specific organizations. And over that 20 years, I noticed that there were a lot of cracks in terms of the people who were able to access the organizations and those who weren't able to access it. And I noticed this trend moving forward over time. And I noticed that there was a number of um, a number of trends that I was experiencing, as well as my fellow colleagues were experiencing. And I was really interested in understanding what what were these trends? Why did they exist? And why were they happening? Um, and, and who was kind of benefiting and who wasn't benefiting? So this experience led me to do my um, dissertation research. And again, my work is very much grounded in the activism experience that I have and had um, and the community relationships that I developed over those times. So what I wanted to do was um, take a microscope to these cracks and better understand why is it that racial girls and women were falling through them. So just a bit of an agenda so you have an idea of how I'll be framing this conversation. Um, so I'll be talking really briefly about my research questions, about the theoretical framework that, um, that creates the foundation for this research, as well as um, you know, the data, the data collection I did, and the methodology that I used to, to um, do this research. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time discussing those things. Um, and then I'm going to spend really the majority of my time talking about the research themes that came forward in my research, um, some of the examples of how this research enacted, and some calls to action um, that I really developed through my research, because I think it's important not only to think about what's happening, but to think about what we can do about it. Um, and then we're going to have some time at the end where I'd be happy to answer any questions um, or have a conversation about how this might apply. Um, in your context here in New Zealand. So what the research questions that framed my research um, look at what are the structural limitations of feminist nonprofit organizations and what are the implications for racialized and indigenous activists who work within them? How does whiteness as a structure, as a systemic and structural concept operate within feminist nonprofits with racialized and indigenous activist workers? 
And how do activists understand their work of supporting racialized and indigenous girls and women within institutions? What are the pressures and tensions of this engagement? So, so these are the um, questions that framed the research um, and, and what I was thinking about when I was working um, with activists in my community. So the data that I collected, I worked with 14 self-identified racialized and indigenous activists in the greater Vancouver area over the course of five months. Um, combined, these, um, these women, these community members had over 100 years of experience. Um, so they had tremendous amounts of experience working in feminist organizations of all different kinds. Um, and a, about a year after the original research was done, I did a follow-up focus group where nine of the 14 women attended. Um, so again, I can make sure that I was on the right track. As a community-based researcher, it was really important that my research was was foundational, was um, was coming from the community itself, and wasn't just this idea that I had in the in the ivory tower, but that I was checking along with um, with the, my community members and with the people who were doing this work. Um, regularly to ensure that I wasn't um, misappropriating their words or misunderstanding um, what they were saying. After that, I did two community focus groups, um, one in Calgary and one in Montreal. So um, really to understand how anti-racism was operating within different spaces in Canada. The reason that this, I thought that this was really important is because I wanted to remove um, the work from the from the individual activists to see whether there was a commonality of experience in other organizations around race and racism. Um, everything needs to be locally situated, but um, I wanted to see the ways in which my work could be translated into a larger sphere. So that's where I did those community focus groups. And then I also collected field notes over the course of this year and a half and used all of that as part of the data um, that informed this research. Now, my methodology was a little bit different um, because of the fact that, again, I was working so deeply in community organizations. I really didn't want my work to, um, to create a space where I told more stories um, of violence that were individually being carried on the backs of women of color. Um, and Indigenous women. I really didn't want to have this be an op a situation where women of color would have to sort of spill their tears in order for um, to get a voyeuristic kind of experience. I really wanted to create stories where people could understand the institutional barriers that were existing as opposed to the individual women's experiences. So as a result, I took a different um, a different methodology where I was informed by um, critical race theory counter storytelling. And, um, and then I created a composite counter story where I built all of the stories together to create one story based on a protagonist, Bitty, who informs all of the experiences within the stories. Again, so no individual person would have to carry the burden of the stories that I told. So I know I went over all of that information really quickly. Um, the reason, I, again, I did that is because I want to focus in on the research themes and the research um, in the way that it worked um, and, and how it might be helpful to you. Um, again, I'm happy to come back to any of the methodology or data analysis questions at the end, should anybody be curious about specific details on how I did that. So coming into the research themes, what I noticed within my research is that there was a common trend around the nonprofit industrial complex or the NPIC. And it presented itself in a variety of different ways. So entrenched leadership, oppression within the movement, non-performativity, structural whiteness, activist mental health, capitalism, and perpetuating the cycle. These are the really key themes that presented themselves within my research around the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, there was also a lot of um, a lot of tension around how the nonprofit industrial complex or the NPIC operated with notions of indigeneity and indigenous identity. And finally, a major theme was around um, 
notions of resistance and intentions in the work that um, in the work that folks were doing in feminist organizations. Um, today, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the nonprofit industrial complex, because I think that that is the most pertinent in thinking about how anti-racism operates or doesn't materialize within our organizations. And again, I'm hoping that we'll be able to have more of a an in-depth conversation about that. So, um, so what is the nonprofit industrial complex? Um, so it's an American term that was first coined by um, a feminist organization called Insight Women of Color. Um, these folks are working primarily out of the Bay Area in the US, although they have um, community members that work across the US. And in their book, The Revolution Will Not Be Funded Beyond the Nonprofit Industrial Complex in 2007, they talked about what the nonprofit industrial complex looks like and how it operates in feminist organizations. They talk about how the, no the nonprofit industrial complex is a natural corollary to the prison industrial complex. And really they showcase the ways that nonprofits, governments and foundations are linked through capitalism to prevent social change. Now, this is a really important understanding, and I'm, this um, translates to many other contexts, particularly in Canada, and again, from what I've experienced um, as well in, in here in New Zealand. But really, the NPIC is designed to, quote, monitor and control social justice movements, divert public monies into private hands through foundations, manage and control dissent, in order to make the world safe for capitalism, redirect activist energies into career-based modes of organizing instead of mass-based organizing capable of actually transforming society, allow corporations to make their exploitative and colonial work practices through philanthrop philanthropic work, and encourage social movements to model themselves after capitalist structures rather than to challenge them. So this is a really um, important foundational idea in the feminist movement that I think is really key in terms of understanding how social justice organizing happens today. So essentially what they're showcasing is that um, our feminist organizations have become very much um, in have have developed into nonprofit organizations that create this career-based model of activism. And although there's tremendous amounts of benefit to it as well, there's some really key structural challenges that prevent social change or transformative justice from actually happening within these spaces. And now I think this is a really important um, consideration. And today I'm gonna show you a little bit about how that operates um, in the organizations that I was working with. So again, just coming back to the themes, entrenched leadership, oppression within our movements, non-performativity, structural whiteness, activist mental health, capitalism, and perpetuating the cycle. I'm going to go into further detail um, around the ones with stars and tell you some stories about those and hopefully get an opportunity to talk more about all of them in general. So um, so again, you can see an illustration of how this is operating within organizations. So let's take a look at some examples, right? What, what does this actually look like in our day-to-day -day work? How is this operating in the feminist organizations that, um, that I interviewed, in, in the folks that I interviewed? So I'm going to start off with a story here. And again, as I mentioned earlier, BT is the protagonist of the story. She, she's the main character. And um, through her experience and through her lens, I'm going to tell you um, a story about oppression within our movements. So I start. About five years ago, BT was at a large international women's conference where several thousand activists, academics, organizers, politicians, and youth were gathered from around the world. Several controversial sessions took place that roused a mostly profound consideration and debate about global interpretations of women's bodies as controlled by men, and ironically in this context, as controlled by other women. 
During a particularly contentious session about sex work put on primarily by white presenters to a mixed audience, a number of sex workers and sex work supporters, many of whom were Indigenous and racialized, silently protested outside the workshop venue. There they sat, cross-legged, on the floor with signs that read, if you want to know what a sex worker thinks, ask me. As the heated session emptied, some of the participants decided to engage the protesters by asking them what they thought. The participants and the sex workers were engaged in a respectful dialogue around their interpretation of sex work when the session presenters came out and began shouting at the protesters. The heated argument culminated in one of the session presenters spitting on several of the protesters. Later, Beatty discovered to her shock and dismay that all parties involved in this incident were Canadian feminists. There were women, these were women that Beatty had shared banners with marching down the street to end violence against women. And here they reenacted the violence they had fought so hard against. Betty knew this was not an isolated incident. She had seen injustice like this in the movement over and over again. When people ask Betty what is wrong with organizations, she always tells this story. So what's happening here? Um, in this story, you can see how there's a bit of a savior complex developing how women are not allowed to, some women rather, are not allowed to share their own stories and experiences based on the assumptions of um, who is an authority figure or who should be allowed to tell that story. And you see the lateral violence. Now, this is obviously a very overt example of lateral violence, but this is something that I heard in my research over and over and over again. Although feminist organizations are creating space for us to talk about violence against women, we often don't create the space to talk about how violence is being enacted in our organizations themselves and amongst the feminist communities that we work in. And this is a major oversight in terms of how violence is happening. Now this is added with another intersectional layer of how um, race is playing out, um, how how education, how class are all operating together to disempower certain women from being able to tell their own experiences and talk about their own stories because it might not be favorable to the, to the larger feminist story that we're trying to tell. So you can see how this is operating on a variety of different levels and you have this culminating in somebody being spat on. Now, obviously, this doesn't happen every day, and this is not something we don't see this type of violence happening in our organization every day. Sometimes it's more nuanced, but, but we do see how this operates on a day-to-day -day basis in a variety of different environments. So, so you have some of, some of these um, major themes that are operating within, um, within this idea of how lateral violence or oppression within our movements is, is happening, um, amongst other things. So um, another story I wanted to share is how non-performativity and structural whiteness operate within feminist organizations. So another story from Betty. Betty does not usually attend the board meetings, but this month she had been invited to present the newly written intersectionality policy. Betty had never been to a board meeting at this particular organization, but she had been to many before in other spaces, so she was pretty familiar with the makeup. She knew that she would be invited to speak on the intersectionality policy at the beginning of the board member and then asked to leave. Board me meetings normally didn't include any staff apart from the executive director or ED. It wasn't that they were not allowed to be there, but it was generally discouraged. The bar large boardroom in the middle of the space had all the usual suspects, a veggie platter with a multicolor presence of veggies and hummus in the middle. Pitas were cut up in small triangular shapes on a separate plate to accommodate those that are gluten-free. A similar multicolor platter of fresh fruit sat next to it. <laughs> 
A batch of homemade vegan brownies sat in a plastic container at the head of the table. Audible mmms could be heard as the board member uncovered her treats. I made brownies, she said. They are vegan. She smiles at Betty, pleased by her accomplishment. Betty smiles back. Many older white feminists sat smiling in the chairs, passing along the brownies. One by one, they went around the table, informally introducing themselves to Betty. So happy you could make it today, one says, looking at Betty with kind eyes. Another leaves, another leans over in what looks looked like it was intended to be a whisper, but in actuality it was just her regular voice. I'm excited to hear about your policy tonight. I've been asking for it for a long time. They both laugh. It has been a long time coming, Betty responds. The ED swoops in rushing, carrying a pile of disheveled papers. Her entrances into the room were always comical, as though trailed by an animated puff of smoke. She was always late to meetings, not because she didn't care, but because she always had so much on her plate. Sorry I'm late, she exclaims as she flops down into the only empty seat. Shall we get started? She looks over and smiles at the board chair sitting to her left. Papers get organized as they get passed around the room. Betty watched as the board meeting process moved through the room in its usual proceedings, a strange mix of business as usual and feminist politics, as they call the meeting to order with a gavel and then proceed with check-ins. Smiles and laughter ensued as each board member shared stories of children and lunch gone wrong, a comfortable familiarity filled the room amongst the women. When called upon, Betty introduced herself and presented the intersectionality policy. She discussed the challenges the committee encountered in getting this work to where it is now, wanting to ensure that everyone had an equal voice and to make sure they carefully thought who was missing in this policy. All the board members smiled and shared nods of understanding as Betty went through the details. They were progressive and supported the policy to its fullest. As Betty passed around copies of the policy, board members nodded convincingly. They understood the policy and were happy to finally see it to fruition. Betty explained that the next steps of this policy would, would be to see how they could implement it within all aspects of the organization. It was not enough to understand slash acknowledge that women experience multiple mar marginalization. The board needed to think through how to make special accommodations so all women can have more equal access to the organization. Silence filled the room as board members looked up from the policy. A little stunned, but primarily uncomfortable, they turned to the ED to respond to Betty's concerns. Yes, Betty, thanks for your presentation. We will talk about this and get back, talk about this further and get back to you. But it is imperative that someone who wrote the policy be, on, be in on the conversation of how to implement it. Actually, it would probably make sense for all staff. ED cuts off Betty mid sentence. Thanks Betty for your time. We are open to your ideas and we want to hear more about it, about them. We, are, we just no longer have time on the agenda to discuss this issue but you are welcome to schedule a meeting with the executive to talk about this further. The finality of the ED's tone and the nods around the room made it clear. It was time for Betty to leave. The time for her contribution was over. So you can see what's happening here. There are a number of different um, non-performativity elements and structural whiteness that are at play here. Even when the time and energy is put, in, put into making something different, things are not able to actually be actioned out because of the way the organization is designed and prevents the actual engagement from happening. So you see that, um, and even in the way that the um, board meeting itself was organized, you can see the different contradictions and the different layers of, um, of feminist politic and capitalist organization that are layering upon layering of each other, preventing the action from actually taking place. And in this way, act, the action becomes a checkbox, um, a check for a box 
than an actual desire to make things different, right? You have this intersectionality policy, which is the commitment that you made, but you don't actually want to do anything about changing the way the organization operates, right? And you see that in the way that the, um, the action around the policy is being taken up. So emblematic of structural whiteness, these systems are not going to change because they are designed to maintain white supremacy. And this is a conversation that we really need to, to have in more detail in our organizations is how are we matching the status quo by not actually allowing things to change. Um, now, of course, change is really difficult and, and it's a much more difficult process than I am, than I am allowing for consideration through the story. Um, but it's certainly something that um, um, was reflected in my research over and over again that um, that racialized and indigenous community members would come up against this very, very difficult brick wall where there was an idea that their process was willing to change and there was a willingness and openness to do that, but the structural elements weren't there to actually allow for that change to occur. So that brings me into to my next example, um, or my last example of the day, which is around perpetuating the cycle. So I do have BT stories um, around this, but I wanted to just show you this, um, this really excellent um, infographic that was put out by COCO, um, an organization. I'm not sure if, if some of you have seen it, but it looks at how um, women of color are tokenized within organizations, particularly in leadership. So here you have um, the woman of color entering the organization. You have primarily white leadership and you have um, a tokenized hire and you get a, a honeymoon period at the beginning. So the woman of color feels welcomed. She feels needed and happy. The white leadership feels very confident that they've made the right decision because they've hired somebody with a new idea and everybody feels really committed to the systemic change that needs to happen. So you hire somebody at a high level that is going to be able to rethink the way uh, business as usual within the organization. And then the reality kind of sets in, right? You have the woman of color who points out the issues within the organization, and she tries to work within the organization structures and policies um, with the executive leadership, um, and she pushes for accountability, right? This is where she recognizes sort of after having been in the organization for a period of time, she's able to recognize what are the challenges that are occurring within these organizations, and how is she able to modify the organization organization to accommodate for these challenges. This is where you see the repetitive injury and microaggressions occurring. Um, time and time again, you, you see the small cuts, right, that are happening um, as the woman, of, as the new person, the new uh, uh, fresh idea is coming in and kind of hitting it up against this, this structural embedded um, system. And then you have the response, right? So you have the reality and then the response. Um, this is where the denial of racism occurs, right? The organization denies, ignores, and blames instead of taking accountability. The responsibility of fixing the problem is placed on the woman of color. Um, as the leader in the organization, they, they look at her to be like, well, this is we've never seen this problem before. This is your problem. You've created this problem or you're responsible for this problem. And then it really pits people of color and indigenous communities within the organization against each other because it forces them to take sides. It forces them to, to kind of align one, on one side or the other. And this is where the target and attack happens, right? This is where the retaliation occurs. Um, the organization decides that the woman of color is the problem and targets her. The organization labels the conflict as a communication issue or claims that um, she was not qualified or not a so-called good fit. And, um, and then the woman of color exits the organization and you get a perpetuation of the cycle over again. Now this infographic discusses particularly women of color in leadership and how this is occurring. Um, but 
But throughout my research, I saw how this was occurring in a variety of different venues as women of color were entering organizations, feminist organizations, and being forced out in a variety of different ways. And then you kind of get the circle of um, of the cycle perpetuating self over and over and over again. Now, this particular situation has happened to me personally on three different occasions in three different feminist organizations. And I know of, um, you know, the... I, I have observed this occurring in a variety of different spaces um, in a multitude of ways. So this is a, a real cycle that is occurring. Um, it is something very, very um, tangible and real. Um, so what I'll do now is just go into a small, um, obviously I can't share stories about, about all of the different um, all of the different themes that I uncovered in my research, but I'll just go into sort of a brief overview of some of the other themes that, that came up. So one of them being entrenched leadership. Um, I was finding that founders, executive directors, and high level, level leadership became attached um, to the organization over the course of a very extended period of time. And as a result, the organization was unable to grow. Um, there was also activist mental health, which came up as a very recurrent theme in my research. Um, and one of the most important and notable findings that I that I had, um, every single person I interviewed reported mental health challenges while working amongst these organizations related to organizational challenges and racism. Um, anxiety, depression, and burnout were all very key themes um, in in their experiences and really extended beyond um, the organization that they were working for at that particular time to the organizations they had worked over the course of their entire um, activist um, career. Um, capitalism was also another way that the NPIC was, was largely being promoted um, around mimicking mainstream systems, um, organizations became more concerned with acquiring additional funds than creating systemic change, right? And this is how um, capitalism was being enacted over and over again in the organization. Now, the two other larger themes that I was um, dealing with were around the NPIC and indigeneity. So how indigenous ways of knowing were being co-opted by organizations. Um, and there's a long and continued reality of colonial barriers that most feminist organizations have not taken up seriously enough. And this was a recurrent theme about how um, a similar process around um, anti-racism was operating from an indigenous lens as well. And then finally, a key theme that came up over and over again was around resistance and intentions. So as feminists, we are hiding behind the good intentions that we have in terms of wanting to make the world a more just and radical place to live um, instead of actually creating radical social change. Um, because this, of course, this change is a lot more difficult, right? So this was a, a recurrent theme that was coming up over and over again around how is it that organizations, um, when you have all these well-intentioned people, why is it that the organizations are not able to actually shift? So now that I've taken this time to bum you out about all the things that are wrong with our organizations and all the ways that they're not functioning effectively or appropriately, I want to take a moment to, to shed back, to come back and shed some light on the situation. Now, my research was about cracks and the ways that cracks develop and the way that they operate within feminist organizations. Now, the cracks are there, absolutely. But um, I, in my spare time, I like to do pottery, and I'm always reminded of the Japanese art of kintsugi, which is um, gold, golden joinery, where you take the cracks, you take the broken pieces, and you inject gold in them to put them back together. Now, this sometimes repairs the cracks and makes the, the actual object more beautiful. Other times you can use this as a way to create something entirely different while still using the foundational pieces that exist, right? So, so a reminder that although um, cracks do exist in our organizations, we can absolutely fill these cracks 
repair them, make them better, or altogether create the foundation for something entirely new. So, um, so hopefully this will be a reminder um, that that there is hope in terms of being able to repair the cracks that we identify and uh, being able to, to again create something new and perhaps and and definitely more beautiful. So with that in mind, I'd like to take my final moments here just to share some of the calls to action that I um, came up with in my research in consultation with the community organizations and activists that I worked with. So five um, calls to action, um, maximum terms, physical spaces, mental health, implementation plans, and removing colonial barriers. And I'll just go into them briefly now. So the first is um, maximum terms. So, um, it's really important for organizations to impose maximum terms for in organizational leadership, including executive directors and boards of directors. After a given term, the leader should leave the organization entirely for at least one other term before re rejoining in another capacity. So this is something again that I saw there would be maximum terms for executive directors, for instance, but as the executive director left the organization from that capacity, they would just rejoin as a board member. So they would never actually leave the organization itself um, and provide a break or a shift, right? Um, so not only will this reduce entrenched leadership, um, entrenched long-standing ideologies, it'll also provide more people with the opportunity to develop leadership skills and experience, which, um, which I think is key and really important. Um, and obviously those over obviously those terms will overlap so there will always be organizational continuity but ensuring that there is a break and creating space for new ways of um, thinking and doing. Oops, sorry. Uh, the second will be is around physical spaces. <laughs> so I didn't get a chance to go into my stories around physical spaces today. But um, one key outcome that um, came from my research was really that organizations need to consider physical spaces, both in terms of the location of the office and the design of the space inside as well. Um, they need to ensure the physical spaces that organizations are housed in are located in accessible neighborhoods and that the office design accounts for some of the challenges identified, including natural light and temperature. Um, also identify the ways that physical spaces and individual mental health are connected. Um, again, because oftentimes feminist organizations are on a tight budget, um, some of these things get overlooked and it's so important that, um, that they don't. Uh, thirdly, around mental health. Um, so organizations need to address the mental health implications of doing service work, especially for communities of color and communities who are multiply marginalized or working within their self-identified communities. Financial support, financially supporting confidential, culturally appropriate mental health services to be used at the dis discretion of staff and formally implementing culturally appropriate and individualized forms of wellness in the office. Um, this is key in terms of ensuring mental health can be maintained over the course of the organization. Uh, implementation plans. So creating implementation action plans for any diversity, culture, or multicultural policies in the organization, developing realistic timelines and attaching funding dollars to this plan to ensure effective execution. Um, again, this happens all too often is that we create these plans, we create these policies, but don't attach any funding dollars to them. And as a result, they're not able to go any further than the pieces of paper that they're written onto creating tangible long-term plans to implement reports into action, acknowledging the time and energy required to develop and maintain relationships and communities. Again, this is key because these are the kinds of things that don't happen overnight. Um, and then finally, removing colonial barriers. So creating institution specific ways to address occupying stolen territories that go beyond acknowledging the territory, right? So this is something that needs to happen really localized um, with, the, with the different communities that you're working with on the traditional lands that you're on. Um, identifying the historical context specific to the land that's occupied and creating a plan based upon that history. 
Um, this may include developing relationships and networks with local Indigenous communities, asking for advice, and following through with the advice that's given. Because this is also something that I saw over and over again, is that there would be lots of opportunities to ask for advice, but again, no action in actually following through with that advice. Um, acknowledging that developing meaningful relationships can and does take years and ensuring that the plan you develop is long term, ensuring that you are following local community protocols and not unnecessarily burdening communities with historical racism and ignorance. So again, acknowledging that um, oftentimes communities of color and Indigenous communities are, are asked to do all of this additional labor. Um, so finding ways to, to prevent that from happening so that that you can engage with um, the expertise of communities without, again, burdening them. So, so there it is. Uh, tons of information, tons of um, tons of ideas and thinking into a blank void. I hope that um, you've been able to um, take something useful from from some of the research that I provided here. And I'm happy to to take some time to answer some questions or hear some feedback um, around how this might apply in your context. Yeah, what I'm Jade. Um, I'm just going <coughs> to hand over it in a second to Jala and just wanted to acknowledge you and thank you. I think I was really sitting with um, the powerful, the power of stories in terms of the emotional impact that it has when you're telling them um, and the importance of that um, emotional side as well as the analytical side for this piece of work in particular. And just really want you to acknowledge um, the importance of us those of us who do hold white privilege to say implicated in this work and not just try and brush it off as being a good ally for the ongoing um, commitment and journey that this requires. So I just wanted to um, hold that while I was doing all the tech, I was quite enjoying that. I could hand it over to Jala, who will start engaging with you in Q&As because I know she'll probably have taken lots of great notes as I was. Um, just one of the things I was really enjoying um, which is something I often talk about around the good intentions and the need for radical change. Um, and that was something of, yes, how do we actually create that radical change and not just um, pat ourselves on the back on the little good intentions that we have, but how do we go further? Yeah. So I'm going to hand over Absolutely. to Jala and um, she can set us off with some good Q&As while other people get, jump into the um either into the chat or also into the Q&A box and we will feed them through. Kia ora. Thank you so much, Manji. That was uh, really, really powerful, really insightful, and I think very, very relevant. I um, was also kind of watching the chat as you were talking and lots of people were really relating to what you were saying and, and the experiences. And I think it's really um, cool to see your research within the Canadian context um, and how many people within our context can connect with that. Um, and I guess one of the things that I wanted to kick us off with thinking about before we dive into some of the questions that participants have put forward is about how you see the information and the analysis that you've derived from the Canadian context and whether you think that there are ways in which that would differ within the New Zealand context um, and, and how we can kind of find the, those areas of dissonance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, thanks for the question. I think that it's really important that we're again, locally situated, right? And and you have a very different context in in terms of the titi titi o in in your relationship with um with Maori communities locally and the responsibility that um that organizations have here as treaty partners, right? There's something legally binding in a very different way than it is in Canada. And I think that that needs to be situationally explored. Um, you know, something I I don't have the expertise on, but I know that many folks um, you know, in your communities do. So thinking about that in a way that is very um, targeted and thoughtful, um, but then also acknowledging that the landscape of New Zealand is changing, right? You have many different immigrants from different communities who are coming. Um, you know, I live here in um, Auckland and I, I see the, the lived realities of that, right? There are people who are coming in from all different parts of the world that don't have um, a relationship with Titiriti in the same way that um, Pakeha might have or people who have lived here for many generations, right? So how do you 
flip the switch of that conversation, acknowledging that, um, you know, you don't just have two communities here, right? You don't just have Maori and Pakeha. You have this, um, this diverse landscape, uh, along with this this very large Pacifica community here, right? The largest in any city in, in the Pacific, from what I understand. So really acknowledging how does that conversation play into, um, into this anti-racism piece, acknowledging that um, there is no mistake that um, there is intersectional analysis that needs to happen, right? Your poorest communities in this country are Maori and Pacifica communities. They are brown bodies, right? And that is not an accident. So thinking about how this is structural um, along with this new history is something so situational to this particular context. Oh, thank you for that, Fakato. That was, yeah, really important. And I really, um, as somebody who is Toiwi and who is not Maori and not Pakiha, I definitely, within myself and within my communities, feel that tension um, of, of how we by having privilege and experiencing marginalization, which I think is such an interesting and complex tension to hold um, and very, very unique to specific groups. But I totally agree. And I also really appreciate having lots of the chat about how many people are relating um, this experience of anti-racism to other experiences um, of ableism or, you know, cis heteronormativity and that kind of thing, and how it is they're almost a nexus of issues that layer intersectionality in a way that cannot be extrapolated from each other. I think mm -hmm. what we're here really highlights how we have to be taking this perspective from all of these positions um, and providing those spaces for each identity to kind of share their stories. Um, okay. And I'll just get you to take a deep breath, um, uh, Jala, just so we can slow down for the transcriber. <laughs> I'm excited that I talk too fast. Um, <laughs> So I'm just going to pop some of these questions up for you. So someone's asked if you could um, expand a little on the concept of non-performativity as it was a term that they had never before. Sure. Yeah. So um, if you're interested in non-performativity, um, I really encourage you to check out um, Sarah Ahmed's work, um, particularly around her work with diversity organizers. Um, I believe it's a Beyond Diversity, I think it's called, but I can um, float the link out to you folks if, if uh, you'd like. Um, anyways, what, what she talks about is how organizations are, again, and you saw it with the story of um, the intersectionality policy, right? You put the effort and the energy into creating this policy, but then you don't want to implement it, right? So that when somebody comes to you and says, oh, well, there's racism in your organization, and you can say, oh, no, 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 we have an intersectionality policy. There's no racism in our organization. But if it's just a policy that's on a piece of paper that's not actually actioning out, um, it doesn't do anything, right? It's only as good as the piece of paper that it actually works on. Um, the way Sarah Ahmed talks about it is around brick walls. Um, so you'll see that people are coming up to do, you have, um, and you know, with Black Lives Matter and what's happening um, globally, you have this huge influx of promoting diversity and equity um, officers or workers within a variety of different organizations. But what happens is they come into the organization and then they end up doing the paper instead of doing the work. You know, those are her words. The way that she thinks about it is that they end up, you know, kind of promoting these policies, but not actually changing the lived experiences of racialized people who are doing the work. Absolutely. Yeah, I can, I've definitely um, seen and witnessed that kind of um, behaviors and structures before. So hundred percent. Someone asked, also asked about suggestions for if you are a white woman, not in a leadership role, but wanting to hold account the mostly white leadership for changing structural whiteness within their own organization. And if you had any advice or guidance on how to go about that. Mm -hmm. Well, there's plenty of work out there around being a good ally and what that looks like, um, right? So I think that definitely tapping into some of that information. Um, I think being accountable to yourself, being accountable to the people who are doing the work is really important. Um, naming racism in a way that um, 
that doesn't always fall. So the responsibility doesn't always fall on the people of color in the room to do that work um, and, and acknowledging that, right? Acknowledging how systems are racist and how systems are problematic and just reflecting it back. Now, my conversation happens primarily around systems because I think that that's a safer way to have the conversation. And then no individual person needs to bear the responsibility of being a racist, right? You can look at how the systems themselves are really problematic. And this is from extended experiences of, you know, of these um, uh, historical racism that's been happening over generations, right? So really just calling out the systems themselves, I think, tends to be the best way. And, and you know, holding yourself and the leadership accountable by forcing, you know, these policies or these actions, the programs from happening, happening in the way that, um, that they should. Yeah. And again, I'm encouraging folks to, to read up on all of the, the great um, ally work that's already out there. Yeah, definitely. And if you have any particular resources that you suggest as being particularly good, we would love to get them and we can forward them through. Um, sure. I also know whether I think Miriam wants to add on a little bit about this conversation. Do I? I just saw a little like uh, tick pop up, be like, I want to answer this question. It's okay. No worries. Uh, uh, no, I, I said we've answered it live, so we can keep track of what. Uh, I, I, I was just the only thing I could add is, um, I think it's it's important within organisations to figure out who your other allies are when you are a sole worker and build um, community around that. Because if it is a leadership issue, there is a power imbalance between frontline, you know, the worker, the workforce, and the leadership. And so just thinking strategically who your other ally, who your other white folk allies might be um, so that it doesn't bear that responsibility on um, people of colour within your organisation, just as a strategy. Also, just to add to that too, um, I think this doesn't have to be like sometimes for workers themselves, it doesn't have to be revolutionary change, right? As individuals, what can we do? We can talk about how much we make to make sure that we all know that we're making the same amount of money, right? We can talk about pay equity. We can talk about, um, you know, some of these other things that that we hide under the covers because we don't want to get involved. We can talk about who gets opportunity for professional development, right? We can talk about who gets promoted. Like it doesn't need to be these revolutionary system throwing, you know, turning the table over kinds of changes. Um, individual people can make difference through those small things too and I think that just links really well to um do you have any other suggestions just other than just counseling about how to manage the mental health of, of in particular people of color um within our work and mm -hmm. one of the things I've often talked about is um recognizing the additional expertise that often we are accessing when we um you know even if it's token recruitment actually going well this person is bringing in additional expertise and we are taxing them each time we ask them for that input. So are we financially recognizing that? Are we paying them for that expertise is also one, but you might have many others. Absolutely. You know, those kinds of key things that come in just from my experiences of working with organizations, mm -hmm. right? Um, paying for lunch once in a while, acknowledging like the organizational space, right? Making sure that you have natural light in your organization, making sure that people are able to easily access your space, right? Being able to work from home if if that's a benefit, right? These kinds of, and making sure people have computers that function, right? Making sure like these really, these things that we forget because we're dealing with very um, limited financial resources and budgets, um, we, we need to create space for that, right? And ensuring that um, ensuring that people have access to childcare when they need it, right? All of those things that, that we overlook because we don't have large company health insurance policies or, you know, on-site daycares or those kinds of things that, that these larger organizations would have. So ensuring that, that we, we think about a feminist ethic and a feminist care of practice. Um, in addition to that, Mental health, you know, we're talking about intersectionality here. No individual is coming in as just one thing, right? Are we creating a radical access, right? Are we creating disability justice? Are we being trans inclusive? Like all of those things that come with a feminist ethic, a feminist practice, 
we need to acknowledge that. And I know it's exhausting and it's a lot, right? It's a lot. To, it's tiring being a feminist. I agree. Um, but but this is the work that we've committed to, right? So how mm. can we engage with those ideas and acknowledge and acknowledge our limitations, right? Like, yes, mm. most organizations can't have an in-house daycare. I get that, right? But how can we acknowledge and work with our community partners to create a radical justice space with what we can? I think that's a really awesome point around this this kind of smaller actions that we as individuals and as organizations can do. I think, you know, we all work in a space where we focus a lot on structural, focus a lot on like radical transformation. And I think sometimes the smaller actions definitely get lost one thing I would add into that, um, in my experience, is we often assume that people representing a particular cultural identity have their own cultural community that provides their own wraparound support, which is often not the case for those who have experienced displacement or, or refugees backgrounds, etc. And so I think the act of facilitation of creating um, communities of people of color who are working in the space is really, really important as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, the and another question is about, is the way forward the transporting of resourcing to people of color run or driven services? I don't think there's one answer, right? I think that there is um, a lot of different answers. And again, they're really situated based on the type of work you do, the type of organization you work on, the scale that you practice in. Um, I do think that um, communities need to be able to have that conversation. Um, so again, we if you're deal if you're working with um, you know a primarily uh, Samoan community, right? You need to speak to that community to see what are the supports that you need. If you're speaking to a primarily Indian immigrant community, a South Asian community, you need to speak to that community, right? There is no one one size fits all that'll kind of work everywhere. Um, but I do think that um, an acknowledgement that we need to think about sort of the professional career based model of feminist practice that we've engaged in through this non through nonprofit organizations needs to be dismantled a little bit to see what's missing and who falls into the practice of that, right? Um, so unfortunately, I don't have a good answer to that question. It's a great question. But I think that's a question that you can definitely take back to your organization and ask, you know, how do we need to, to shift our um, modus operandi here? Absolutely. And I'm just mindful of time. We do have one question left, which potentially is a quick wrap up question and then we'll end um, with some final thoughts from you, Manjeet, maybe. Um, so it's a the question around length of term. If you have any ideas of what that, you know, a maximum length of term and leadership roles and governance levels, have you had any thinking or ideas around what you would advise to organizations? Yeah, I think in general, what I've seen is anywhere between three and five years works really well in a leadership organization that provides enough space for continuity um, without kind of entrenching. And again, you know, things change so quickly, right? That having somebody who has a fresh perspective can be really beneficial. Now, having said that, I know that um, that doesn't work for a lot of organizations because of the way that their funding works. Um, and, you know, that might need to be extended to, to other spaces. It just depends on the organization themselves. Um, but I, I've been surprised by how um, like a three to five term, three to five year term has has been really efficient. Great. Thank you so much. And are there any last comments as we wrap up today that you'd like to maybe leave us with in terms of moving forward in this space and your own personal call to action for ourselves. <laughs> uh, sure, all I can say is, you know, it's it's my pleasure. I, I encourage everybody, I welcome anybody to to get in touch with me directly if you have questions about, um, you know, my methodology or, or any of the work that I've done. But just a real reminder, you know, I, I am a, a feminist, I'm a feminist organizer, a feminist activist, um, and the work that we do is so crucial to radical social change, right? So even though we see these cracks, it doesn't mean that the change isn't there and it doesn't mean that our intentions can't actually fuel a revolution. Um, so I, I encourage people to, to take um, those hopeful ideas and, and be reminded that, um, that we can fundamentally shift the way we do our work. Um, and it's not as much work as it sounds, it's just a commitment to follow through.
That is a great um, ending and I think I will savour that and hopefully others will savour that as we move forward and in these um, in these challenging areas that we try and work with, you know, it's, I think that's um, the reality is that our commitment is to challenge and continue to be challenged in creating this revolution together. Um, and so I'm happy to have found a new a new friend to walk alongside um, in this journey. So thank you. Um, I, I'm hearing lots from the chat of heartfelt thanks um, and I'm mindful that our transcriber does need to leave soon. So we'll close with a karakia and we'll wish you well on your journey. Unihia, unihia, unihia ki te uru tapanui, ki awatea ke mama, te nako titinana, te wairo i te ara takata, ko yara e rongo whakairia a ki ki runga, ki a tīna, tīna, huie, tai kie. Go well, everyone. Thank you so much for today. Thank you. And we will see you at another Tornest presentation. Ka kite anō.